What's up, Bridge City Church family? Pastor John here, North Braddock Campus Pastor, just welcoming you to our 4th of July weekend online worship experience. We're so glad that you took some time in the busyness of celebrating the birthday of this great nation to tune in with us to enjoy one of the many freedoms that we have as Americans, the, the, the freedom to religious expression. And we are so thankful that God has allowed us to be not only in this nation, but to make an impact in this nation and the world around us. And if this is your first time tuning in with us here at Bridge City Church Online, we just wanna welcome you and say thank you for spending some time with us. We also wanna invite you to click the new here link uh, so that we can get to know you a little bit more and so that we can get a, a free gift of $5 coffee gift card for you. Just our way of saying, Thanks for checking us out online. Now, I am super excited. I know the fourth is just a few days past, but no reason to stop the celebration. And so we don't want it to just be fireworks and star spangled banners, but the reason why we came here today, the thing we're celebrating is Jesus Christ. And so as we get our hearts ready for worship, let's just believe God for some fireworks and just some explosions of the experience of his presence as we lift our voices to worship him. Let's worship. Won't you stand? Let's get ready to worship our God in this place. Come on. I'll praise in the valley. I'll praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure, I praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm numbered, I praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water, my enemies drowning. It's long. praise when I don't. I praise cause I know you're still in control. Cause crazy is a weapon, it's more than a sound. My praise is the shout that brings Jericho down. As long as I'm breathing, as long as I'm breathing. This is why we praise today. I'll praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I'll praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Come on, sing it out.
I've got one response I've got just one move With my arms stretched wide So come on my soul, but don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise the Lord, yeah. Oh come on my soul, but don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you've got a lion Don't you get shy. 
Amen. What an awesome time of worship. I just love getting into the presence of God by taking my eyes off of what's going on in my life and in the world around me and fixing my eyes on Jesus. And you know, we love worship so much, we don't want the worship to stop with our singing. And so we wanna take some time and just shift to another aspect of our worship of God, and that's giving. You know, a lot of people, they, they have a lot of thoughts about the church and money and different things like that, but giving is a, an important and vital part of our worship to God. It's, it's us showing not just our love for God, because God doesn't need our money. Actually, he's the one who gave it to us in the first place but it's an act of surrender and trust and adoration. It's our way of saying, we trust you, we love you, we worship you, and we honor you. And so as we shift the focus of our worship from our singing to our giving, you can just follow the prompts there on the screen because giving is such an amazing opportunity that we have. And one of the things that I often tell people is, you know, we will never not, yeah, that's a double negative, but we will never not give people an opportunity to give. Why? Because the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And we wanna see you more blessed. And so just follow the prompts there. And as always, we just thank you so much for your generosity and your faithfulness to God through Bridge City Church. And as you're finishing up giving there, we got a lot of amazing things that are happening this summer at Bridge City Church. And the first thing I wanna tell you about actually isn't even happening at Bridge City Church. It's actually happening at a, a church that we have great relationship with, uh, Greater Works Church in Monroeville. And we are going to be participating in an event that they're hosting. It's a five-day event in the middle of July called the Holy Spirit Seminar. Our lead pastor, Pastor Rick, is gonna be uh, ministering in the Word on one of those evenings. Our worship team is gonna be ministering in song on a different one of those evenings, but whichever evening you are able to make it, it's a Monday through Friday event. Each of the worship experiences start at 7 p.m., but we wanna encourage you and invite you to come out to all of them or whichever ones you're able to make it to. It's gonna be a great and awesome time as we experience the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. 
And another great event that we're happening again, not even happening at Bridge City Church, but Bridge City Church is a part of this awesome opportunity on August 4th, the Pittsburgh Outdoor Worship Experience at Highmark Stadium. This is gonna be an awesome time. Many, many churches in the Pittsburgh area are gonna be getting together. We're all gonna be meeting together at Highmark Stadium at 11 a.m. on August 4th to just worship our God together because we are a part of a church, but even more importantly, we are a part of the church, and that's the Church of Jesus Christ, a global and eternal entity that Jesus himself paid the price of his blood for. And so we're gonna get together with our brothers and sisters from many different local churches to worship the same Jesus on the same day, Sunday, August 4th at 11 a.m. And we're also gonna be having water baptisms at this event. And so if you've never taken your next step of being water baptized, first you believe in Jesus, this is what the Bible teaches. First we believe in Jesus and we publicly De declare and confess our faith in Jesus Christ. And the next step after that is to be water baptized, symbolizing us dying with him and rising again from the grave with him. And so if you've never been water baptized, you can just follow the prompts there to sign up online and someone will reach out to you and give you more details on how to participate in that. Well, I'm super excited that those are the opportunities that we're gonna be participating in this summer because the message for today in our What Do I Believe When I Don't Know What To Believe series is talking about the church. That's right, not just a church, but the church, the corporate body of believers from all time that Jesus gave his life for. And so I'm so pumped to hear Pastor Rick share with us this week on what we believe about the church. Pastor Rick, take it away. What do I believe about the church? The question that we want to answer today is the tension is, can I be a Christian and not be involved in a local church? I believe that you, to be involved with God is to be involved with his church. See, the doctrine of salvation is the good news that's proclaimed that we belong to God as individuals. Now, the doctrine of the church is that we belong to one another. You see, even in the Old Testament, when God called his people out of Egypt, out of bondage and captivity, it wasn't so that they could be self-ruled, but that they would be God-ruled. He was calling a people, that's right, a people unto himself. So here's the big idea. The big idea today is this. The local church is the place that we become fully devoted followers when we participate in the family of God, the body of Christ, in the temple of the Holy Spirit. I love that statement because it includes all three parts of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, before I launch into our text here and really define the doctrine, what we believe about the church, there's three questions, three questions, that determine every decision we make. Yeah, that's right, first one is about theology, who is God? That's right, who is God? The second question is who am I? That defines my identity, but more important than just who am I, who am I to God? Now this third one, this third question is who are we? Who do we, plural, belong to? And, 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 and that's where we belong to one another and we belong together to God. So it's all about he, me, and we. So when we, we discover this, it, it, it really, this, our behavior follows our beliefs. 
and then we find out what we really believe. So let me give you three thoughts about Jesus' church, and then we're going to go to Matthew 16. Three just thoughts about Jesus' church. The first one is, is that Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. We see this in Acts 20, 28, the words of the Apostle Paul. So it's his church. He purchased it. I, I always like what our founding pastor always says, you can't have a church. It's not my church. It's not your church. To, to have a church, you have to give your, your own life for it. You have to give your life for the church. And then you have to be dead, buried, and rise again three days later and ascend to heaven. That's the only way you get one. So really, it's not my church. It's not your church. It's Jesus' church. Second one is, is that Jesus is coming back for his church. That's right. He's coming back for a pure and spotless bride. That's what we are referred to biblically as the church. The last one here is this, is that Jesus is the head of the church. So these three concepts are very important to understand what I'm about to communicate with you here. So let's go to Matthew chapter 16. It's really difficult actually to talk about the doctrine of the church, what we really believe, and not use these verses from Matthew. Matthew chapter 16, 15 through 18. He, well this is being Jesus, said to them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now there's a couple things about this. Number one, we see that Jesus' church is built on the revelation of who Jesus is, He's building it. He purchased it. He's going to bring it to completion here. And, the, and when you see the word church, this is the first time that Jesus mentions the word church. The second chapters later, both have authority and keys attached to it. That's right. Authority, the authority of Jesus is found in his church. This is what we refer to as the first mention principle. The first mention of the word church in the Bible here. So this word, ecclesia, Jesus chose a very significant word in ecclesia. It means a, the called out ones, an assembly or congregation. It's a group of citizens called out and assembled together to do the business of the government under which they function. Now, Jesus chose a very significant non-religious word to define the church. He was defining something that in the day that the Bible was written, yeah, back in the day that the Bible was written, it was written in, in people in that context and culture would know exactly what he was saying. This is a significant group uh, very similar to what we would refer to as a carpenter's union or a certain lodge that there's significant standards and rules by which a union is designed to protect and help and support you, but the power is in being all together in the union, okay? And so, but they have a significant government in the ways and rules in which they function. So when Jesus used this, he said, yeah, I'm calling you out of the world, but I'm calling you not just to have salvation, but to be a part of a significant group of people, us together. Yeah, this word church is used 114 times in the New Testament. 90 of these refer to a specific uh, people in a specific place doing a specific work together here. It's understanding this. It's a special group of people. Now, Jesus is not afraid to call us out. Now, let's just think about Bridge City Church. Bridge City defines the, the area, our region. We're one church in four locations. And that we're, so Bridge City identifies that we are part of a specific place in a specific time. But we're also building bridges 
to people's lives. That's right, connecting to God, we connect to, we connect to others, but we're connecting others to God. We want to be a bridge in which people meet Jesus Christ and become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. This is so important. In the New Testament, in the New Testament, a third to a half of the, of, of, of the book, of the whole book of the New Testament, is written to, to, to local churches. Nine epistles written directly, three to pastors. Even in the book of Revelation, it starts off with a message to seven local churches. This is significant. Local church, church was in God's mind and in his heart to do a significant work. That's what this is so important here. In the New Testament, there are th over 30 mentions of local churches here. Also, there are six references to the plurality of churches in an area. That's right. We are not the answer to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to be the church. We are a part of a plurality of churches. Now, an example of that, in, in very upcoming weeks here, very soon, we're going to experience an outdoor worship experience with 10 different local churches. Now, that doesn't represent all of Pittsburgh, but again, it represents more than just one church. It's a plurality and unity of churches gathering together. And I sure hope that you will join us on August 4th for that special worship time. Also coming up, there's a Holy Spirit seminar held in another local church in our area at Greater Works Outreach. We're going to be a part of this. Our worship team, I'm speaking, but it's an example of churches working together in an area to minister to needs there. So we become fully devoted followers of Jesus when we participate. There's three metaphors that are found in the Bible with the local church. And notice I keep saying local church, not just the universal church, all of, of all believers, but a local expression. Let me define what that can mean here. There's three expressions that we want to look at. The first one is the family of God. The family of God. We are marked by our love for one another in our family. It's been said that you can, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. That's right. Family's family. Unfortunately, most of us, when we think of family, we have a very dysfunctional thought process when it comes to family. We have all these different thoughts that flood in when it comes to family. And, 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 and this is really what we are as the family of God. It's a sacred siblinghood. I like that word. Sacred siblinghood. It's a shared sense of mission that we all have as brothers and sisters in Christ. In Ephesians 1.5, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing, him, bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So he wanted to create a family, because after all, he's a father. That's what fathers do. In Ephesians 2.19, so now you are no longer Gentiles, no longer strangers and, and foreigners, but are citizens along with all God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Isn't it interesting that, that in the Bible here, the Apostle Paul likens us to the family of God. This is so vitally important. It's where we experience love, where we experience identity, where we experience unity, all of these things here. Now, I came to a revelation a long time ago. Pastor Keith, our founding pastor, who I've known now for over 42 years. There's been times that, that he, that I've, as, as I've looked at him as a spiritual father, there's been times where he's really irritated me. Well, that's kind of what fathers do. Hint, hint for all the kids out there. Yeah, they do. And, and I used to get fussy over this until I realized my own natural father irritated me as well. But I never ever once said, I'm not going to be a part of the family anymore. I'm going to break my covenant relationship with the family. The same is true with God's church. In the church, when we speak of family, what we're really saying is, is this group of people has a high potential to really irritate me and to really, really cause hurt and pain. But at the end of the day, we have a covenant relationship as family. So 
Here it is. We may not have it all together, but we are all in it together. That is family. Family is family. And we stick together. We work together. But as a church grows, we don't experience family even in a whole local church. We experience it in small groups and we experience it with those who we serve with. Yeah, that's family. So as I participate in the family of God and I learn sacred siblinghood with brothers and sisters, great, great things happen. Let's look at the next one here. The next one is the body of Christ. Now, this speaks to our function, the body of Christ here, connected. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. That you is plural, not singular here. See, 1 Corinthians 12, I would love to just read this whole chapter and break it down for you because it really speaks to the body of Christ here. It describes the interconnectedness and the interdependence as well as our individual contributions. That's what the body is. My body is very, every part is interconnected and interdependent and each part has to do its share. We belong to one another. Now, just recently, I tore my calf muscle playing tennis. And see, I tore my calf muscle and it, it, it ruptured something. And man, I'm in a boot right now. I'm not able to walk, not able to do the things I want to do. But one of the things I keep noticing is this, is that the rest of my body has to overcompensate for this problem that I have in my, in my left calf. So my right leg is the one that's really sore right now because it's having to do the work of the left leg as well. My hips and my back are out of order. Even my shoulders are hurting because my whole body is out of whack right now. And my left leg is becoming smaller than my right leg. Oh, it's so frustrating. But what this is, is this is an example of the body of Christ and how we all need to function. And yes, hurts, pain, and problems happen in the body of Christ. But that's why the body was designed to heal. I don't need surgery. My tore muscle is going to heal itself because it didn't tear completely away from the ligaments, tendons, and bone. It just, it just tore itself. So it has to get healed up. It will get healed up. And then I'm going to have to train it to, to, to get stronger so my body can function the way that the creator designed it to. So when we're hurt, we don't pull away. We don't disassociate with the body. No, we get connected to the body in interdependence here. That's what the body of Christ is all about. The downtrodden lifted, the brokenhearted healed, the captive set free. That's what the body of Jesus did. So that's what the body of Christ should do. Now let me speak for a moment about membership. That's right, church membership. This comes up a lot. Do I have to be a part of, do I have to be a member? And is there such a thing as membership in the Bible? First of all, let me clarify. You do not find the word church membership in the Bible. Well, you don't find rapture and you don't find the word trinity there either. So to say that, well, just since it's not in the Bible, it doesn't exist, really isn't true. When you see the body, it's, it, it's a member. How do you know that these fingers are a member of my body? Well, they're connected to the body and they're functioning within the body. So to be a member is to be related, connected, and also to be functioning. That's why here at Bridge City Church, we always say to be a, to be a member, you got to get into a group, get into relationships, and also serve on a team. Have a function. Because that's what our body does. Now, there's all the time, we're tempted to disconnect, disassociate, and not be a part of the body. It's not an option. That's right. See, to be a member, it's saying that I'm in covenant relationship to the body here. And there will be hurts. There will be pain. But it's, I'm not just going to date the bride of Christ. I'm going to be totally connected and committed to the bride of Christ. Not as a consumer, but a contributor. So why membership? 
Let me explain it this way. So that we can represent Jesus to the world. That's what he wants us to do. Bring healing and hope to a lost and dying world. How do we do that? Through covenant relationship. I keep using this word covenant because it shows up in so many of the doctrines that we've been covering. Covenant means is that we both have an agreement before God and the difference between a contract and a covenant is when we have a covenant, there's a third party recipient. As a result of our covenant in Jesus' church, what that means is, is the third party recipient is the world. That's right. It's the world that we, we serve. So we're in covenant. We have, we're connected in relationship. There's contribution. I'm functioning. I'm giving of my time. I'm giving of my talent. And I'm even giving of my treasure, giving financially. But there's also this word, accountability. Yes. So why membership? It gives us three, these three things. That I am a part of this local assembly. And, and I believe that there's, that, that there's this thing that we have in our lives called called commitment phobia. Many people keep saying, well, I don't need to be a part of the local church. I don't need to be a member. As long as I'm giving, as long as I'm serving, it's like, why wouldn't we be? I mean, we're willing to sign a mortgage statement for 15 to 30 years. We're willing to sign a car payment for seven years and have a big payment that we agree in writing, but we won't do that for Jesus's church. We won't do that for relationships that matter most. That would be like me saying to Natalie, I don't need to make a covenant relationship. Why do we need to put it on paper? A marriage license is only a piece of paper. No, it's a covenant relationship. Why wouldn't I want to sign? Why wouldn't I want to be a part? I think because with a house and with a car and with these other things, we see it. But with church membership, some of it's intangible. We get to be a part of a local assembly that's representing Jesus to the world. That's right. See, at Bridge City Church, we all have the same commitment, but we have different function. As an example, my heart in my body right now has a very significant function. My body could not function without my heart. Now, if I lost a finger or right now I don't have use of my calf, my body can still function. But we all have different function, but we all have the same commitment. Different function, same commitment. And I am so thankful to be a part of a church that we all have the same commitment one to another. Now let's look at the next one, the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now this is being written to a local church, not me as an individual, but us in a local expression of who Jesus is. Do you not know that you, plural, are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you, plural? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy. You are that temple. Yeah, temple is a sanctuary, a divine dwelling place. It's the place where God resides. God doesn't reside in a building. God resides in our lives being joined together. Now this verse is very significant. Some translations use the word defile. Some use the word destroy. But really what that means is it's a co corrupting influence of sin. Uh, it can be of coercion or manipulation. It's moral deterioration, breaking down the whole. This is a very serious thing. If we defile God's local church, God says he's going to break us down. He's going to destroy us. This is not something we hear a lot in local church because typically we go to church and we want the pastor to be committed. We want the leadership to do certain things, but we never think about what we're doing that can destroy or hurt Jesus' church here. Yeah, so if it's holy, that means that there's standards. There's standards of holiness. Now, when you go to a restaurant, don't you really like it when they have standards? I love places with high standards. Because I'm trusting that, it, that this is important and that my health is important and that, that what I'm eating in the, in the case of a restaurant is important that we're all protected. The same is true in a church. It's holy and it matters to God. So as we participate in the family of God, the body of Christ, 
in the temple of the Holy Spirit, being built up to offer praise and glory to God. As I participate in this, I become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, I do not believe you can become a fully devoted follower of Christ or even mature. What is maturity? Maturity is not sitting in a church or even watching videos. Maturity is being able to take responsibility for somebody else and help them to grow, be protected. That, my friends, is true maturity. It's not just listening to messages. It's putting them into practice for the help of others. Those are three significant metaphors. Now, let me just briefly talk about some practicals here. Let's talk about the local church. The local church is built on with elders and pastors. Elders, and I'm not going to read all the verses to you, but I'm going to give them to you on the screen. Elders, that's where government lasts. Government is. Yeah, there's qualifications for elders found in 1 Timothy 3, and Titus 1, and actually 1 Peter as well. Yeah, you put all these together, but most, if not, not all, but almost all, almost all of the qualifications to be a pastor, elder, have to do with character, integrity, people who do not defile God's church, because people who defile God's church, that's a breach of character and integrity. Only, a, there's only a very few qualifications that say apt to teach. So we're not built on a church's gifting, we're built on character and integrity, which speaks volumes here. So elders, they deal with direction, discipline, dollars and doctrine. Pastors, they lead, feed, guide and protect. That's right. And together at our church, they make up the executive team. We work together. We have elders and we have pastors, but they all meet the same qualifications here. So vitally important. Let me read to you a verse that's not read too often in church because it hits a source, a source subject in all of our lives about accountability, being under authority. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Obey has to do with outward obedience. Submission has to do with an attitude of heart. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So let me ask you a question. The way that you are obeying and submitting to your pastors and elders, are they groaning? Oh, or are you bringing them great joy? Bringing them great joy is an advantage to you. That's what that really, really is here. So there's a touchy subject with accountability, but we need accountability in our lives. That's what we need we, because it protects us. That's what it does. So within Jesus' church, he gives us gifts. They're found in Ephesians chapter 4, 11 and 12. It's what we refer to as fivefold ministry. The apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Now I know true Bible scholars are going to say pastor, teacher in the Greek, the original writing of Ephesians here, communicate the same thing. Pastor, teacher are one. But for the sake of our conversation here, we have, we have the apostle expand, expanding, organizational, making sure that discipleship is taking place. The prophet, the voice of alignment, yeah, and warning. Evangelist, reaching out to people and bringing them into the church. And then the pastor, the shepherd, God's people, and the teacher, making sure that the word of God and doctrine are clear. All these five do one thing. They equip God's people for work. That's what we do. Next, you have deacons. In our place, we call them team leaders. Their authority is delegated and limited to accomplish a certain task within the church. And different churches have different ways they do this. I'm just talking about Jesus' church. A doctrine, we see these clear. They can be done differently in churches, but they need to be done. We have elders and pastors, and we have, we have deacons. And then church members. That's right, part of the family of God part of the body of Christ and, and being built into the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, there can be no real community without accountability. We all need accountability in our lives. I don't, who would want to live in a neighborhood or a community that had no accountability? That would mean that everybody that lives on your street, maybe lives in your apartment building, Everybody can do whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want. No accountability. Would you want to live there? 
Your neighbors could just come in and out of your house and take whatever they wanted. They could do whatever they wanted on your lawn or with your car or with your family. No. We would say that would that be crazy. But why do we think that's okay in Jesus' church? We must have true accountability because this with the community must have accountability. And that's why we have the fivefold ministers. That's why we have elders and pastors. That's why we have team leaders to make sure that standards of the body, the temple, and the family are up, upheld. This is why this is so important. See, I, when we live in a, in a culture and society that want to have community, but it doesn't want accountability. It doesn't want standards. It doesn't want the word of God to be expressed. So we have people saying, well, I love Jesus, but I don't want anything to do with this church. I love Jesus, but you know, the church is just selfish. I've been hurt by the church, all these other things. And may I say to you today that it's time to get healed and get to be a part of something that Jesus is coming back for. Let's build the church. Let's be a, be a part of this with pure, holy standards that, that, are, that, that, that honor God. Accountability is what, why we need, why, why we need standards and why we, why we have church membership and why we have standards in our giving and our serving and the way that we do it. Because we don't want anybody to stumble over anything except for Jesus Christ and to meet him in a real way and serve and please him and glorify him. So when we say be a part of the church, we're asking you to be a part of the body, the temple and the family in a real and great way. Let's never become a part of the duns. Been there, done that. Done with church. There's this thing in our culture talks about deconstruction. I'm deconstructing my faith. Unfortunately, it leads to de-churching. Unfortunately, for some, it leads to deconverting. But de-churching, oh, I'm still believing God, but I can do it on my own. You can't prove that biblically. When you look at the Bible and what it communicates, that is our framework. That's by which we do things. And so I'm inviting you to be a part of Jesus' church. That's right, this holy, great organism that's full of life and vitality and healing and everything that it brings with it. That's what I want you to be a part of. And I want you to dare to believe again because there's nothing like the local church when it's working. How do we become a part of the local church? First of all, we get connected to God the Father through Jesus Christ. That's right, we say, God, I'm a sinner, I've fallen short. Forgive me of my sin. I want to be a part of you. And then our next step after salvation is to be a part of us belonging together. I hope that today you're understanding Jesus' church in a whole new way, a fresh way, a fresh look. So what do I believe about Jesus' church when I don't know what to believe? Realizing first, it's an invitation to know and love God well. And that's our invitation to you. Hey, thanks so much for being a part of this. And I'm just so honored to share this with you. You're going to want to come back next week. Next week, I'm just going to have the opportunity to share some things that I've been thinking and meditating on a lot. And it's about just how do you stay in love with Jesus? You know, because sometimes life can be a real drag. Hey, look forward to sharing that with you. You won't want to miss that message. Have an awesome week. How many of you feel like you learned something today about the Church of Jesus Christ? Because there's a lot of misconceptions about what church is and what Christians are or are to be. And I'm so thankful that we get to be a part of the family of God, the body of Christ, and the temple of the Holy Spirit. And maybe you're watching this and you've never made the decision to receive Jesus Christ as the forgiver of your past and the leader to your future. That's right, the Lord and Savior of your life. You've never accept that price that he paid for the church that he wants you to be a part of. Well, you know what? Today is the day, and right now is the best time to do it. And so if you don't have a day and a time when you have uh, received Jesus as the forgiver of your past and the leader to your future, then let's let today, right now, be that time. And so you can follow the prompts there on your screen um, because this is something, this is an inward decision that we make 
that then produces an external response in our lives and in the world around us. And like I said earlier, one of those external responses is water baptism. And so if today is your day to receive Jesus, we just wanna welcome you to the family of God and encourage you to sign up for that next step of water baptism. Well, that's it from us here at Bridge City Church. We do hope you have an amazing rest of your day and we look forward to hopefully seeing you in person at one of our four locations in the near future. God bless.